Hey, good morning Sandy Piners. Mike Gruppen here uh, with the Sandy Pines Chapel. We just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning for our online service. Uh, today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, what a beautiful day it is today, at least the day that I'm videotaping this. I don't know what the rest of the week holds and uh, quite frankly, I don't know what the rest of the summer holds. Uh, but we are so thankful that you are joining us here today. We are all looking forward to the time that we can get back together and worship together as a community. Uh, but for the time being, uh, we are going to be making these uh, videos and doing online services. So we would welcome you to join us each week right here. And uh, we are just so blessed that we have this kind of technology that we can make these things happen. Uh, this morning, we are going to be blessed right off the bat. Uh, leading us in worship this morning is Walter Williams. He's a singer, songwriter, uh, very talented musician, and uh, we are going to be really, really blessed. He's a, he's a, he's a uh, powerful singer with a powerful testimony. Walt? Are you ready for the fire? Good morning, Sandy Pines. Thank you for having me at this service today. Here's a little bit on Wake Up. Everybody gather around. We're here in the name of the Lord. Make no mistake about it. Or to shout it. That's what we come here for. Forget about your problems. Forget about those cares. Take your burdens and leave them there. At the feet of Jesus, let's just pray.
my humble cry while another now I fall do not pass me by let me at thy throne of mercy Thank you, Walter, for those amazing songs. If you're anything like me, you were probably up in your living room dancing during that first song. That was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks again, Walter. He's going to come back for one more song here in just a few minutes. But right now, I want to go over a few announcements. Uh, again, we just want to thank you uh, as the Sandy Pines Chapel for uh, being flexible with us as we navigate through uh, these trying times. There's a lot of unknowns, and we're trying to get many things moving right now. Uh, for instance, uh, we know for a fact that the Sunday night concerts are going to be canceled from now through July 12, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get those rolling again uh, as the summer goes on. Uh, also, um, uh, morning worship, again, we are just waiting for a green light on that and to, to see what that's all going to look like. Our desire is to meet again together uh, as, a, as a community, but for the time being, uh, this is where we will be gathering right here on Sunday mornings. Uh, next, youth group. Obviously, uh, that's an area close to me. Uh, I'm the youth leader out here at Sandy Pines, and uh, we are looking for ways to uh, appropriately enter back into meeting together as a youth group. So please stay tuned for further announcements on that. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me uh, directly. Uh, you can connect with me over the uh, Sandy Pines Facebook page. Um, next, we are still uh, have opportunities for giving. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking to, to give to the Sandy Pines Chapel, there's several ways that you can do that. Uh, in particular, 
uh, you can make checks available to the Sandy Pines Chapel and send it to our address. Uh, you can find that address on our website. Uh, feel free to check that out, but probably more convenient is up at the front main gate at the uh, public uh, safety office. There is a box attached to the building and you can drop donations in there as well as prayer requests. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're still praying together as a community and, and meeting the needs of the community. And uh, so speaking of that, we're going to enter into a time of prayer right now uh, prior to uh, one more song from Walter. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this day. Lord, we want to thank you that you hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you that you are intimately involved in every situation that we are going through. Uh, Lord, you know all that's going on in our nation right now. And Lord, we just hand that over to you. And Lord, we know that, that your word says that, that if your people are humble and pray, and Lord, if we turn from our wicked ways, that you will heal our land. And Lord, we just pray this morning that you would heal our land. Heal our land from disease. Heal our land from racism. Lord, heal our land from disunity. Lord, I pray that you would bring us back together again. But bring us together again, Lord, under your name. So, Father, we, we just pray for this morning. We pray for each family that is listening. Lord, you know every circumstance going on in each home. And, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us. Lord, we pray uh, a blessing upon Sandy Pines Chapel and upon uh, Sandy Pines in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Now join us for one more song from Walter. Like I said, he's got a powerful testimony, and this song encapsulates his testimony uh, fr from his heart. So give it a listen. Walter, take it away. You know, I've said this many times. I thank God for praying parents. I thank God for parents that have prayed me through some of the most difficult situations in life. Many, many years ago, I found myself in trouble and I became incarcerated. And I found that the only thing that carried me through were the prayers of my parents and the prayers of people who kept me lifted up before the Lord. Doing time is not an easy thing, but I tell you one thing, if you do it with Jesus, he'll get you through. So for 28 and a half years, my mother would write scriptures and letters and send them to me. And she'd send me books. And she'd send me even the Sunday school lessons for every Sunday. And I know they prayed for me. And I thank God for those prayers. I was the really uh, genuine prodigal son, raised in a Christian home, but straight away. But God made a way and he delivered me. And I thank God. And this song, Guilt to Grace, is my testimony. It doesn't matter if you refuse to see not the same man that I used to be. It's been a long journey, but I'm not through yet. Seeing strangers become my friends who I'll never forget. And I'm not proud of all the things that I've done. The road I took wasn't always straight But I thank God for forgiveness through His Son On this road from guilt to grace Out of the ashes Something beautiful arises Now I see the world Through brand new eyes I 
Thank God for giving me. I'm amazed at what I see today. Because love came along and rescued me. See, I'm not proud of all the things that I've done. The road I took wasn't always straight. I thank God for forgiveness through His Son As I travel on this road from guilt to grace Like the prodigal I ran so far away Love brought me back on this dusty road one day Jesus paid the cost for, for save everybody in this whole world up on Calvary my past was nailed to the cross I'm not proud of all the things I've done the road I took wasn't always straight but I thank God for salvation in his son on this road from guilt to grace from guilt to grace I thank you Lord for making a way and I thank God for salvation through his son On this road, on our road, on your road from guilt to grace. Thank you, Walter, for another amazing song this morning from guilt. To grace, Such a great reminder of the redemptive power of our God, the God that loves us. Uh, such a powerful personal testimony put into song. Uh, again, thank you, Walter, for that. Uh, this morning, we have the honor and privilege as Sandy Piners to welcome back one of our own, Isaiah Hager, who is a pastor at Third Reformed Church in Grand Rapids. He was grew up running around causing all kinds of problems here at Sandy Pines and now he's returning to us to share the word. Another amazing redemptive story uh, of, of what God's uh, influence can do in somebody's life. Let's welcome Isaiah Hager. Well good morning kids of Sandy Pines. I am so happy to be talking to you guys this morning even if it's not in person. You know, I would have loved to gone up forward and call you down, see everyone running towards the stage, and maybe even give you guys some candy, but I guess you'll just have to have your parents do that. Tell them the pastor sent you, and they owe you at least one candy bar for the day. So today I want to talk about names. So my name is Isaiah John Hager, and I'm sure all of you guys have a name, a first name, a middle name, a last name, maybe even two middle names or two last names. And it's always wondered, or been a wondering question of mine of what names mean and where they come from. So my name, Hager, comes from my dad and his dad and his dad before him and probably from somewhere we think in the Netherlands or Germany. And it has this idea with a lot of people because my grandpa, my grandpa Jack Hager, has nine brothers and sisters. So there's a lot of Haggers out there. And every time I meet someone, they wonder if I'm related to one and usually I really don't know. And you guys might have that too. They might say, oh, you're a Johnson. Do you know this person? And you probably don't know. And then my first name is Isaiah. And that comes from two places. A basketball player named Isaiah Thomas and this guy in the Bible whose name was also Isaiah. So this guy named Isaiah in the Bible, it's one of the longest books in the Bible. He was alive for a really long time and did a lot of cool stuff. So if I was with you guys, I would ask what your names are. But as I can't do that, I will just assume 
I heard a bunch of different reasons, and I would ask you where that name comes from. And you guys might not know, but your parents might. My middle name, John, comes from also my mom's side of the family, so, uh, great uncle, and a couple other people who have this name, John. I haven't really ever been too fond of the name, but it comes from a great place. So your names might be named after your dad, or maybe your grandpa. Maybe just sound the same or have the same initials. But all our names mean something to us. Our last name is the family you'll always be a part of, maybe for some of you until you get married. Your first name will never change, and people will know that for the rest of their lives. If you have a teacher in school, they might have known someone with your name before, and they might think, oh, they might be like this person, or they might have had one of your sisters with the same last name. Our names are used to identify us. They're used to let people know who we are. When you talk about a friend, then your parents know who you're talking about. When you say you're going to their house, they know what house you're going to. And you guys might be too young, but at some point you're going to start playing sports and going to school more often. And a lot of things you do will also be an identifier of who you are. You might be a football player or a baseball player, a volleyball player, a softball player, or a wrestler, or someone in the math club, or the science club, or the robotics club. There's so many different things you can be at that you are a part of by name. The thing is that there is really only one thing we have to worry about when we get our identity, and that is this guy named Jesus. I'm sure most of you have heard of him, and if you haven't, let me tell you about this guy who was alive, let's say 2,000-ish years ago. He was alive for 33 years, and he did incredible things. He did miracles. He healed people from being sick. He even brought a person back to life. And he died for our sins. He was someone who gave up his life to protect all of us so that we could have eternal life just like him. So in this world, like I said, you're identified by your name. It may be from family, family lineage or you might just, your parents might just like the Detroit Pistons like mine did. But what really gives you identity, what I want you guys to know this morning, is that Jesus Christ gives you your identity. Whatever someone might think when you go to school, I remember when I was in high school, my older sister, Allie Hager, who has the same last name as me, misbehaved in some classes. And when I had those teachers, they thought I might misbehave as well. And that's going to happen for your whole life. People are going to think you might act away because of your name or because of what you did at some point. But what I want you guys to always remember is that when it really comes down to it, when it really defines who you are, yeah, your family name is a big part of that, but what truly matters is that you were created and made and put a purpose on this earth for because of Jesus Christ and because of God. So when you wonder who you are, as Mufasa says in The Lion King, remember that, yeah, you're a part of your family, but more important and more incredible than that, you're a part of the family of God. And I am so glad that you are all a part of it. Good morning, Sandy Pines. Uh, my name is Isaiah Hager. Um, it's so good to be with you this Sunday. Um, even if it's Saturday afternoon for me, um, I'm so happy to be with you. Uh, I am mourning that we cannot be together in person, but I fully believe and trust that we're still connected by God and through His Holy Spirit. And regardless of physical distance, we're worshiping together this morning. So before I get started, let me pray and then we'll dive into Ephesians 1. God, you are so good, and your love and mercy endure forever. We are so blessed to be worshiping, praising, understanding, and getting to know better a God like you. But help us do those things, because on our own, we cannot do that fully. We find such little success when it doesn't come from you. So, yeah, through my words this morning and through any meditations people may have on their hearts after hearing them, help us to be just a little bit more like you than the, when we started this day. In your name I pray, amen. So as I said, we'll be in Ephesians 1, focusing on verses 3 through 14. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiv forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in heaven and the things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee for our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I said, my name is Isaiah Hager. Um, I am a youth pastor in Grand Rapids at Third Reformed Church. I'm also a seminary student at Grand Rapids Theological Seminary. And I'm a nearly lifelong member of Sandy Pines. 20 years ago in the summer of 2000, my parents bought a lot in phase six, and we have been coming here every summer since then. My mom is on the board. My dad is on a long range planning committee. My sister Courtney worked for a few years in the Dairy Dip. My other sister Allie worked as a lifeguard for six years and I did the same for five summers. So as you can tell, the history and memories that I have in my life and in my family are deeply tied to a place like Sandy Pines. Another part of my life that finds deep history in at Sandy Pines is my adolescence. Um, I was the typical teenager at Sandy Pines. I would drive around playing too loud of music, uh, stay up at the basketball court till midnight being loud for everyone across the street, and would chase down girls all day until we ran out of gas on our golf cart. Um, and between all of those things, I was trying to get away with as much as I could, and usually I wasn't getting away. I garnered somewhat of a reputation here at Sandy Pines, as many people do, especially teenagers. Um, I could have sworn at one point that the Rangers had my picture in the Ranger station, and anytime some blonde haired kid on a green golf cart got reported, they would pretty much show up at my front door at our lot. And sometimes, most of the time, it was warranted. Uh, like I said, I tried to get away with as much as I could. But other times it would happen, and I would have been across the country on a mission trip, maybe lifeguarding all day or just playing video games with my friends. And I would wonder why they were showing up when it wasn't me who was doing something. But as I said, I had quite the reputation. And it wasn't an unfair reputation that I had gained. It was because not, I wasn't known for who I was, but for what I did. And this is something that is true of all of us, especially in this country and in this society. We are known primarily and almost entirely for what we do. If you meet someone new, it's one of the first questions you ask them. You might ask their name, but then you might say, where do you work? What do you do? Where do you go to school if they're younger? It's the beginning of almost any conversation, and it gives the other person millions of presuppositions whenever it's answered. When I am asked that question, what do you do? I say, I'm a youth pastor. I say, I'm a seminary student I'm training to become a full-time pastor. People always react when I say that as they do for most things, but especially when you say you're a pastor, especially somewhere like West Michigan. They may stand up a little taller, start talking about things that make them look good or sound good, or talk about church when they wouldn't have in any other circumstance. Or, like I've shared with you, they might look at me and be kind of confused um, if they know about my past. They might be confused as to why this crazy kid or teenager could end up to be a pastor and in someone like Mai's position. And I really don't blame them. And I don't blame any of you that might have reported this blonde-haired kid from D99 10 or so years ago. I, like I said, deserved it. The only thing that sticks with me about this, and something I mourn, 
is that we truly aren't known for who we are deep down inside because our identity is not given to us by the things we do here on this earth, the things that'll pass away like dust. Our identity is given to us by the God, our God, the one God who will never pass away, that we are children of his. When people give us an identity, we, they put us in a box of limitations, and it's a box that is nearly impossible to break out of. You can kind of push the boundaries of this box sometimes, but truly getting out of it is something that not many people end up doing in their life. You are known for what you do. And we see some of the significant repercussions of this mentality. Um, I've been reading a lot of books this semester, this summer semester for seminary, and one of them is called An Invitation to a Journey by M. Robert Mulholland. Mulholland. And he talks about how in the 80s and 90s he was studying suicide rates. And we have kind of always known that there's this high suicide rate, a bit disproportional with young adults and teenagers, adolescents, people from high school on to their young adult age, about 25. And he assumed from his research and what he had been working on in this book, that as we got to people who were in retirement age, we might see similar statistics. And Time Magazine, shortly after, or during, I should say, while he was looking up these things, came out with a cover article based on suicide rates in America. And it found that the post-retirement age 65 to 85 is twice as likely to commit suicide in their age rate as adolescents are. This group, we know that it's a pandemic. There's this other group that's twice as likely. And obviously, suicide and things like that, depression, have a myriad of different reasons, and you can't pigeonhole it into one thing. But something that Mulholland says is he believes a big part of this and an underlying issue in some of these rates could be that they don't have the identity for what they do yet. For adolescents and young adults, they have yet to start what they will do for decades as their job and what they will be defined and identified with for the rest of their life. They are, if you go to an open house this summer, once we're able to have those and once we're able to celebrate our seniors from high school and college, if you don't really see this, have them count just how many people ask what they're doing next. It'll surprise you that it's almost 100%. I can remember when I graduated high school, it was probably almost 100%. So they have yet to find this identity, and that can lead to confusion and identity issues, and as Mohan suggests, even to the darkest side of that. And then for post-retiree age, these people have done something for so long, for 50, 60 years, maybe a little less, but somewhere in that range, and now they don't. And a lot of people make up for this very well. A lot of people make up for this by finding a hobby to do, finding a part-time job to do, or maybe they get a place at Sandy Pines. But something that is still in that is that they have lost a massive part of their identity as our culture defines it. So you might look at this aside from that, aside from those rates and those statistics and think, well, what's the big deal? If you've if you do something for 40 years, your job, and you work 40 hours a week, you will work at least 183,000 hours doing that thing. It's not a wonder why that becomes such a close part of our identity. And we are the first culture to have problems like this. In the early church, in the early Eastern Asian uh, area of where the Bible was written and where the apostles were sent out to immediately, there were cities that had the same issue. And if Ephesus, which our letter that we read today is written to, has a huge one of these problems. So you have an Ephesus, it's somewhat like New York City for the ancient world. It's this massive port city with hundreds of thousands of people coming in and out, and they have temples and places of worship for any religion that you could ask for in this time. So you have these Jewish people and these Gentile people trying to worship the same God at the same time under the same circumstances. So for the Jews, they can trace their religious lineage back thousands of years. They can trace it back to the times of David, even before that to the time of the Exodus, as this has been a generational faith that they have. And now they're trying to follow the continuation of that faith, which is, as they know it, the way, or as we know it, Christianity. And then right alongside them, wherever they're worshiping, in homes or small assemblies, they could find a Gentile who maybe the week before was worshiping at the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, 
doing all matter of things that the church and the way and Judaism as a whole looks down upon and looks at as sin. So you put all these people together and you try to say, worship in the same way, worship the same God, do the same thing. Your identity is not what you do, but they can't really get past that. When you sit next to someone who acts differently than you, believes differently than you, or looks differently than you, it's hard to say, oh, we're doing the same thing and working to the same goal. So that's where Paul writes this letter to. He writes it to those people saying, no, your identity isn't what you do, what you did last week, or what you did the day before. Your identity is as a child of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you listen carefully to Ephesians 1, you'll see, at least the verses that I read, you'll see that every action and everything that's done to define who we are is entirely done by God. The only thing it really says that we do is sin and fall short. And as the word that Paul uses, we commit trespasses that we have to ask forgiveness of. Really, the only thing we do in Paul's eyes in this, these few verses is negative. It's God doing the work that defines who we are. So as I said, when I was at Sandy Pines and in that time of life, yes, my actions in this culture and in this society affected how people saw me, but my true identity never changed. Especially around that time of my life, no matter what I was doing, and even during that time of life, something else I was struggling with was this issue of identity and something so deep in me that, you know, I didn't know if I really wanted tomorrow to come or if I felt much worth at all, but my worth was never tied truly to what I did, but to who I was as a child of our Lord and Savior. Saying that whatever the world does doesn't matter to us isn't what I'm trying to say. Because we do change our actions depending on our faith. But the thing is, our actions should not be shaped to create our identity. Our actions should be shaped because of our identity that was created for us when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Once we know our identity, then our actions are shaped. This is where, in the letter of James, we get what he's saying. We kind of juxtapose this against what Paul is saying of salvation and justification by faith alone. And James isn't going against that. What James is truly saying, if we really know what he's trying to say to the people he's writing to, is that yes, you have faith and that's when you are saved, but your faith is dead without works. But the works don't predate or proceed the faith. The faith precedes the action. Once you have this true faith, once you truly recognize your identity as a child of our Lord and Savior, then your actions, no matter what you want, no matter how much you try, your actions will look different. It will inevitably happen, and it will happen incredibly. And there are many places where we can talk about how those actions should be shaped once we understand our identity, once we fully realize our identity in God. But I want to end today with talking about two of them. The first one is the word love. Something our world always needs, and especially and desperately needs right now. I'll not make a political statement at Sandy Pines. I know from almost everybody this is our happy place. This is where we go to try to get away from those things and where we want those things not to be ingrained in our day-to-day -day lives when we step foot through whatever gate we take to get in here. But what I will say is that our current responses to events on every side have seriously lacked love. As I said, there are many ways our identity in Christ shapes our actions, but an underlying theme in all of those is love. No matter what we do, no matter how we respond to things, we need love to be at the foundation of that. As it's said, faith, hope, and love are all that remain, and the greatest of those three is love. So when we don't share an opinion with someone, when we try to correct their ways, when we talk about political opinions that we disagree with, when we try to post on social media, when we react to someone, and when we ever express any emotion, anger, fear, disgust, joy, celebration, all of that has to have an underlying sense of love. Maybe you and a family member have never voted the same way and it causes strife. Maybe you can't help but post online when you see other opinions being shared. Maybe, for some of you, 
you go on the Facebook forum for Sandy Pines or some other association and you see one person commenting that just makes your blood pressure rise. Respond only out of love or don't respond at all. And Luke Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. And then a couple verses later, as you and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinner loves those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. It's not necessarily an impressive feat in Jesus' eyes for us to love people that show us love or give us many reasons that they should receive it from us. What Jesus puts the emphasis on, specifically so, is loving those that it's the hardest for us to love, or at least show love to. We may have this sense of love, but showing love is much different than that and much deeper than that. Second is another word, but it's not one from our English language. Um, as I said, I've been in seminary for this past year since the fall, and I took two Greek classes. And something my professor kept saying and would often repeat to us is, Greek isn't a magical language, as we often think of Greek and Hebrew, the languages of the Bible. It is words. It was words to just a different culture than what we are now in, in our English-speaking culture for most of us. But there is something we lose when we translate things, especially from the Bible, into English. So I'm not doing what my professor said to stray from. And if he is, for some reason, watching this, I hope he doesn't think I'm doing that. What I'm trying to do is talk about some of those nuanced meanings of a word. And that word is ophelema. And it comes from the root ophelo. And ophelema, it means debts or trespasses. And that's kind of the, one of the main uses for it. It is the word used in the Lord's Prayer when it says, forgive me for my trespasses and those who trespass against me. But ophelema and ophelo have a second definition as well. And that definition is the failure to do what we are obligated to do. So there's the one side of it. Don't do bad. Don't do wrong. And don't let the things that are wrong and the things that are bad affect your actions. Don't do them. But there's also the other side of it that you can't just abstain from doing bad, but we must actively seek out to do good. When we think of this word and we think of what we're trying to do with the Lord's Prayer, something we've all prayed before, it's not just saying, well, forgive me for the things I did wrong. It's forgive me for every single opportunity I had to do the right thing and failed to live up to those expectations that you, O oh Lord, require of me. And that is married with the first word we talked about, love. Give me every ability and wherewithal to act in all of those things with love, not just refraining from the opposite of love, but the specific active action of doing and showing love to others. Going above and beyond what this world teaches us is good enough, but God never asks us to be good enough. Loving those who love us is good enough, but that's not what we're called to do. What we are called to do is practice our faith and be more like Jesus than we did at the start of the day, and that is never easy. But we have to do it yet. So don't try to make your identity be reliant on this world. You will always be limited and pigeonholed and incomplete. My, one of my favorite professors at Lee University, which was my undergrad, is Dr. Terry Cross. And he had this sermon earlier this year, it might have been uh, in the fall, where he says, if I can quote him right, he says, when I limit you, when I identify you and put you, I put you in this box of limitations, but when we let God shape our identity, the only limitations we have are those outside of his plan for us. So, we need to treat others in that way. That we let their identity be shaped by God. So that they aren't put in this box of limitations and put in this small space where we're allowed to let them act. When you are let to act as God wants you to, and when the world and those in it uh, know that your identity is in God, then your only limitations 
are, as Dr. Cross said, of those in God's plan. And that's what we know as the only truth in this world. So make your identity and your belonging in God and treat others the same way. Your family, your friends, those who are less fortunate, those who look differently than you, who think differently than you, your neighbor on one side who you get along with and hang out with all the time, and your neighbor on the other side that you can't stand when their car car pulls in the driveway. All of these people are who we should show these things to. Our governor, our president, whoever our next president might be, any governing official that we disagree with. George Floyd and Derek Chauvin are those who deserve us to show them love. If our identity is as a beautiful creation made in the image of God, then so is every other person who has, does, or will walk on this earth. And when we realize that, unimaginable good can happen. So I thank you for joining me this morning. Um, if you, uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me and have more meditations on this, um, I'm sure we can find a way to get my contact information out there. Um, as I said, we have a place here at D99. Um, we're still there. Don't go reporting me, but I would love to wave hi or say hi to any of you that this might have resonated with. And as always, let the grace and peace and love of our God remain with you always this day and your next day. Amen. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation When all is dark, you help us see. And there is only one salvation. We believe, we believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptation Given us.
the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life.